So I was actually born in Casper, Wyoming. Lived in Louisiana for a few years and then moved to Texas. So I, I claim Texas as my home. Grew up in small town life, hard work and work ethic and you know being honest, humble, integrity. Um, those are some of the values my dad instilled in me. I was in college for September 11th. I'd always wanted to do some sort of federal law enforcement. And that was my goal. But September 11th kind of changed that. And I found what's called the 18 X-ray program for the United States Army Special Forces. It's a program that basically allows you to go to basic training, uh, then you go to airborne school, and then you get to go to Special Forces Assessment and Selection uh, and, and try to earn the Green Beret. Fortunately, I was successful. What drew me to the, to the Green Beret specifically was their actual mission set, ensuring freedom and the American way of life via training and equipping and those kind of things is something that we, we believe in. I uh, went to the Special Operation or Special Forces uh, Qualification course in 2006, graduated in 2007, around August. Took some leave and then signed into my first unit in October, which is the 3rd Special Forces Group. And then we deployed literally like two weeks later. Freshly graduated, brand new Green Brave with no experience, I don't know anything, and then the next thing you know, I'm in Afghanistan. OD 396-3336 now. It was an awesome team. Since I met them basically in Afghanistan, I was kind of welcomed into the team pretty pretty early on, pretty quickly, because it just had to be that way. Great teammates, great mentors. Um, Ron Schur, a fellow Medal of Honor recipient, who's recently passed, was a, took me under his wing very quickly. And that value of kind of teamwork and trust, come to find out, is something that got us through that whole entire deployment. April 2008, we were charged with doing a a capture kill mission of a high value paid commander up in the mountains of northeastern Afghanistan. Normal raid, kind of thing that we've done several times before. Uh, it was our ODA, um, a sister ODA, was on another kind of part of the objective, and about 100 Afghan commandos. We're going to fly into this valley, um, land, and then go assault uh, a village um, looking for this guy. We we're supposed to infill, kind of ride at daybreak got pushed to almost mid-morning due to some weather and things of that nature. So we finally took off and, and went. You know, the, the flight there was kind of like every other one, but a little bit more quiet. Everybody's just kind of wondering, you know, why it takes so long. So we get there and helicopters come to a hover, but the helicopters couldn't land because it was such a rocky, treacherous terrain. It was basically a valley river bottom that was dry. And I remember getting to the back of a Chinook helicopter and looking down, there's probably about a 10 foot drop between you know, the tailgate and the ground. So that's kind of how the day started. So it was a kind of a wake up call. We began to kind of move to the village. The village is on a mountaintop. Um, and like I said, we were in a valley. It's not the most ideal situation, but just kind of the only way we could get it done. I was in actually the third element. We had a lead element and then our middle crew of kind of the command teams and then our guys in the back as a support by fire maneuverable force. The initial team had made it almost to the mouth of the village and that's when kind of the whole valley erupted. We started taking RPG fire and machine gun fire, what seemed like from every direction. Shortly thereafter, the, the call on the radio came over that one of our guys had been hit. The lead element, which contained the ground commander, was trapped. They had sustained several casualties and were pinned with nowhere to go. Sergeant Williams and the rest of the soldiers were forced to take cover from enemy fire. The mountain was terraced. Uh, there was basically a trail going up each level until you hit the top. They were about halfway up, uh, kind of pinned down there with one guy being injured so far. Um, so medic, runcher, and team sergeant began to make their way up there. And I called out to Scott, our team sergeant, and asked him if he wanted me to come with, with them and, and bring my commandos and you know, at least provide some support. Um, he said, sure, so we took off and Ran across the kind of the valley floor, across the river, and then made our way up to that element. Sergeant Williams led his commandos across a 100 meter valley of ice covered boulders and through an ice cold, waist deep river while braving enemy gunfire. The unit had to fight up the mountain through intense enemy fire in order to make it to the trapped element. Sergeant Williams then directed his commandos to provide suppressive fire, which would keep the enemy from overrunning the element while he rendered aid. By the time we got up there, we would already taken two casualties. So Dylan Bear had been shot in the hip, and Luis Morales had been shot uh, in the ankle and a, a couple other places. Um, he was actually shot rendering aid to Dylan. So we have two casualties, one medic. Ron immediately started getting to work and doing what he needed to do. 
and then Kyle Walton, the captain, myself, and Scott Ford begin to kind of take stock and look around and see what the situation actually was. I kind of moved down to start bringing guys up and, and help move casualties and things like that, and two other casualties were taken. So Scott had got shot in the chest plate and the arm, and John Walling had been shot in the shin, and it basically amputated his lower leg. So now our casualty count was four in that same location. When I found that out, I climbed back up to where they were located, uh, kind of took stock of the situation. Master Sergeant Scott Ford was hit by a sniper round. Sergeant Williams, after already taking a trip down and back up the mountain, yet again placed himself in the line of enemy fire in order to move Scott down the mountainside to safety. And I handed him off to Seth Howard, who helped readjust his tourniquet and make sure everything was good as bandages, and he helped. He handed him back off to another guy uh, who took him down the bottom of the mountain. From that point, the enemy kind of knew that they had had those guys pinned down or really peppered them pretty hard with, with fire. So we, we actually waited a while to try to get them on the radio. We were kind of trying to establish comms with them, but managed the tactical situation too. Seth was shooting um, Carl Gustav rounds, so shoulder fired rockets into the village. I was returning fire, and a, a, a strafe of bullets came through. And it's almost like the movies I could see them hit in front of Seth, dot the ground, and then hit right by my face and explode rocks onto my face. After literally a couple hours had passed, we weren't able to get them on comms at all. So Seth and I actually kind of anticipated that they were all shot. At that point, Seth and I were like, all right, we gotta go. Sergeant Williams, knowing that he could not climb back up the mountain directly because of the heavy fire, decided to scale a cliff face in order to make it to an outcropping with a vantage point of his other team members. That's when we saw Kyle, the team leader, who got a hold of him. He was able to reestablish communications with Hire and everything. From that point forward, Seth and I moved up to their location, started laying out cover fire and, and helping them move back down the mountainside. Sergeant Williams again led the commandos in a firefight that lasted several hours, ensuring that the wounded would not be overrun by insurgents. One of the guys, Dave Sanders, had found a route like down the cliff and they were able to start moving casualties. We just helped them move the other casualties down to include our one of our interpreters who was killed uh, early on in the gunfight. From that point, we were able to evac everybody down and Ron continued to treat four casualties with, you know, being one medic with one aid bag, which is a miracle in itself that, that those guys are, are still around. You know, we realized that we had too many casualties for, to, to really move and do anything with, uh, being four total, the plan was basically to call in medevacs for those guys and then kind of rearrange our forces, provide cover fire the best we could. The whole time all that was going on, our CCT, Zach Reiner, Air Force Combat Controller, was dropping bombs on the village and, and truly one of the reasons that we're here today was his efforts. So we were able to get everybody down and, and the medevac crews flew in, they were awesome. The, the helicopters were getting shot up, one of the pilots got wounded I believe but we were able to evac all the wounded guys, all four of them, uh, evac the, the interpreter who was killed and a couple of Afghan commandos too. Kind of resolidated our forces, made sure we had everybody, had everything, and we were able to exfil the, the village itself. It was seven hours, um, and really what kept me focused, what kept all of us focused was, was our, our, our brothers to the left and right of us, you know, Ron, on top of the guys working, keeping them alive. You know, got shot in the helmet, shot in the arm, or grazed his arm, but never, never wavered from taking care of, of the guys. The team came together, the trust, the camaraderie, all the things that we built through extremely hard training and, and working together, you know, really paid off. Originally, there was 10 Silver Stars awarded for the, the action itself uh, and one Air Force Cross. 2018, September-ish, I got the phone call from the Lieutenant Colonel in the Army. So about five or 10 minutes prior to the phone, the phone call scheduled time, I get in my truck and turn it on and, you know, so I can have Bluetooth for the phone and, and like hear what's going on. And my wife, Kate, was working out in the garage. Phone rings and I answer it and the lady on the other end says, please hold for the president. Uh, yeah, and I uh, was just shocked basically. And still kind of didn't know where this was gonna go, but I text, Kate and said, hey, come get in my truck. She was able to get in the truck right as President Trump was, was saying, you know, he looked forward to seeing me at the White House. Sergeant Williams distinguished himself by acts of gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty on April 6, 2008, while serving as a weapons sergeant, Special Forces Operational Detachment Alpha 336, Special Operations Task Force 33, 
in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. So for me, still being in with the medal is, at first it was interesting, you know, nobody really knew what to do, um, how to handle it, and luckily I was able to fall back on Ron, who had lived this life for a year, um, and, and he kind of told me, you know, the ins and outs of how things were, and I was able to translate that to the chain of command. Everybody understands I'm, I'm just a guy, I want to continue to serve, and they've allowed me to do that um, to the utmost of my ability. I never wanted to to really do anything other than be a Green Beret, and, and they've let me do that, and I've, I've continued to, to be able to do that. I now find myself in leadership positions that are you know, extraordinarily fulfilling because I get to give back to the younger guys, and as long as I continue to have the support to, to do that, I'll, I'll keep, keep it up. For me, every time I wear this thing, I think about you know, all the guys that have given their lives for our freedom and our ability to, to be here. And I, and I think about the hundreds of stories of guys and gals every day doing you know, heroic things for the country, doing amazing things that you know, maybe don't go documented as well or whatever. But it reminds me, it's my responsibility to put this medal on, represent them, um, and, and give them a voice. Uh, you know, and, and as I continue down this path, I, I hope that I can be a voice for you know, veterans, a voice for those who have served, and, and then inspire a younger generation to, to follow in our footsteps, whether it's you know, for two years, four years, or 20. Um, you know, I hope, hopefully I can inspire that, that next generation.